What's up YouTube, this is Dennis Panyuta for Tutorials.eu. In this two hour course, you are going to learn the basics of Jetpack Compose. So of this Android framework that has been released this year and it allows you to build beautiful applications using Kotlin code only. So you don't need to use XML code anymore. You can just build the UI using Kotlin. And that's really cool. It's a very different approach. It's similar to what is being done in Flutter. So if you know Dart and Flutter already, this will be very common to you. But basically what you're doing is you are writing widgets that you then use as UI elements in your codes. And it's a very cool thing. It's called composables then. And this video is just the beginning. So if you really like this video, you should hit the like button because once this video hits 500 likes, we are going to upload another video, which will be how to build the entire Gmail UI using Jetpack Compose. So if you want to learn that as well, hit the like button and also subscribe to that channel if you don't want to miss out because we're going to upload that Gmail video on that particular Android specific channel. So tutorials.eu slash Android. And you can find the link in the description below to the channel as well as to the complete course because those two parts of the course are just going to be a small section of the entire course. So if you want to learn everything that there is to know about Jetpack Compose, definitely check out my Jetpack Compose masterclass. And by the way, if you don't know Kotlin programming at all, don't worry, check out my Android Masterclass YouTube video that I have uploaded. It's a nine hour course where you learn the, the basics of Kotlin programming in the first six hours or so of that YouTube video. So check those out because you need to understand the basics before being able to do anything that you're going to learn in this video. All right. So a bunch of things that you need to do. Now let's, let's look at what we're going to build. And in this video, we are going to build uh, this user interface that you can see here. And along the way, you are going to learn a lot about Jetpack Compose. All right. So you can see that we have a profile image here of a dog in particular. And this is going to be a card in which we then have an image in which we have a bunch of texts. And then we also have buttons and they are positioned accordingly. So there's a lot to learn about rows, columns, as well as constraint layouts and how to use those not in XML, but particularly in Kotlin using composables and Jetpack Compose. So the framework. Okay, so I would say let's get started with the fundamentals. I wish you all the best. And by the way, don't forget to hit that like button if you don't want to miss out and see the Gmail video and subscribe to our tutorials EU Android channel if you want to see that video once it comes out. Let's jump into Jetpack Compose and see what it has to offer and what it even is. So in the past couple of years, developing native Android applications has improved quite significantly, ranging from architecture improvements to the tools and libraries that help in speeding up development. But the way we create UI widgets and its interactions remains the same, where we most times need to have a layout built with XML and then an activity or fragment that we have to write with either Java or Kotlin to interact with the user interface widgets in the layout. The good news is all of this changes with the newest UI framework, Jetpack Compose. So Jetpack Compose is a declarative toolkit for creating high quality user interface components, making it easier and faster to write beautiful applications with less code. So there is no need for separate XML layouts or multiple activities. So just one activity that will serve as an entry point into the API is required. Composable functions are capable of building, maintaining and updating the user interface. And since XML files are no longer required, there's no need for find view by ID, view binding or data binding, which each were quite complicated and cumbersome to a degree. Well, find view by ID was quite simple, but had its flaws by itself. So all of those techniques, they were there and they served their purpose, but now it's time to have a better approach, which is Jetpack Compose. So Jetpack Compose is interoperable with the traditional way of developing Android applications and can be added to already existing projects while you migrate gradually to using composables only. Is just about a normal function with the add composable annotation. So we have this function my app here, where for example, we have the greeting, or we'll call the greeting function and pass welcome to tutorials EU. 
and we're going to see how this actually works in an actual application. We're going to build a bunch of composables. We're going to use existing composables, but also build many of them ourselves. We're even going to go as far as to build entirely custom composables that are going to be quite advanced and complex, but super powerful and not too difficult to understand because of the beauty of Jetpack Compose in general. So let's go ahead and see this in action. Welcome back. In this video, we're going to create a new project, which is going to be built using Jetpack Compose. So here on the new project, you can just select empty compose activity and it will generate the Jetpack Compose code for you. So I'm going to call this application doc profile page. And you can see that the package name is going to be eu.tutorials.docprofile page. I have the safe location as well as Something very interesting is that the language is set to Kotlin and I cannot change it. And that is because we're using Jetpack Compose and this is limited to Kotlin and is not built for Java. Then we have the minimum SDK of being API 21. So let's go ahead and create the project. This will take a little while and once it's done, the files will be ready. But let's already look at our main activity.kt. So we have our main activity class, which is inheriting from component activity. And it has an onCreate method as we would have even without Jetpack Compose, just using the old fashioned approach. Well, we call the super method and then we set the content to use our dog profile page theme. So let's not focus on this part for now. However, let's look a little further down. We can see that we have composables here. Quick pause. In this video, you're learning something about app development. And if you want to learn more about Android Jetpack Compose specifically, then you should definitely check out my Android Jetpack Compose masterclass in which you are learning the fundamentals of Jetpack Compose, but then also go into more advanced topics by building multiple applications. For example, we're going to build an entire news application from scratch, which contains loading data from an API using retrofit, then using coroutines and the MVVM architecture in order to make it a really clean application and a lot more. So it's a 16 hour long course where you get the code, exercises, quizzes, and obviously also the Q&A support. So whenever you have questions, you can ask them and we're going to help you out. So get the course down in the description. You get a huge discount over 80% and I hope to see you in that course. So now let's get back to the video. So this main activity KT file not only has the main activity class in it, but it also has a couple of composables in here. In this case, the greeting composable and the default preview. So let's look at this greeting composable. As you can see, it contains a text composable. Text is a composable and can also be referred to as a UI element. For any composable, it must be referenced from another composable. That is why the greeting function has the composable annotation. So here this at composable is an annotation. And if we get rid of it, for example, we will see that we get an error because this text here is also a composable. So you cannot use composables inside of normal functions. The functions themselves need to be composable as well. The main activity also contains other built-in composables. The set content, for example. So if we go up here, this here is also a composable, which declares the UI content to the activity. The doc profile page theme, which is created using the name given during the project creation with a theme attached at the end. This is used to provide the look and feel of our application. So you can go over to your projects now and open up UI theme. And there you will find that you have the theme KT file. In UI theme, you can not only see your theme KT file, but you can also see the type, the shapes and the colors. These were also files automatically created for us. We will be talking about theme in detail in later lectures. Every project needs an activity to serve as the entry point into the application, which is why we have a manifest file where this activity is defined, which is the entry point to our application. So let's look at this file real quick. We can see it is an XML file. So it's using the XML language, so to speak. 
we have the manifest keyword and then inside of it we have the application so here are some parameters that are defined for our application and then we have the activity that is defined here and you can see it is the main activity that's the name of it and it is using a certain theme which is the dog profile page no action bar theme and you could jump over to it it's under your themes xml file if you wanted to know more about it so there are just two items in there which says the window action bar is false and window no title is set to true so it deactivates the action bar but it makes sure that the no title is uh, set to true okay so this themes xml file by the way is found under your resources values themes xml so there are even some more files that were automatically generated you can see there is this colors xml the strings xml which were created for us some drawable files as well as some mip maps we're going to go over those and use those different files over the period of this course but now let's go back to our android manifest xml so we have the intent filter which basically just handles which activities to open up and how to jump from one activity to another for example so what we're saying here is when we open up the application we want to use this activity because the action is the main action and then the category is that this is the launcher activity basically when we are launching our application it will launch this activity which will be our main activity and currently that obviously makes sense because we only have one activity but what if we have multiple screens in the future well then it would make sense to obviously know in which activity we want to get started with so if you have a login activity for example so a login screen and then you have a screen where you see the details for your particular user account that you logged in it would make sense to see the login screen first before you can actually get to your data right because otherwise you could see the data of a user that is not you so that is definitely something you need to take into consideration when building applications and we are going to consider that obviously okay so that's the general structure of our application so we have our main activity which sets the content with composables we have a composable here at the bottom which says greeting and the text and then we have a preview of our application so we can see how this would look in the preview but therefore we need to at least build the application once so let's run it real quick and build it because otherwise the designer will not show us anything so here at the top you can see you can go to your code you can split the screen so you see the code and the designer or you can jump to this desi the designer only okay so we have this text which just says hello and name and then here we call this method greeting which says greeting with the name of android so it's going to show the text of hello android okay so once the application is installed we can see it here and it says hello android at the top left corner which is basically this text here so now please go ahead and replace this android with your own name so it displays hello and then your name okay i hope you tried it it should basically be in my case hello dennis so i'm calling this greeting composable function which is this greeting function right here and i'm passing the name which is a string called dennis to it and it's going to set this text composable to have the property of text say hello and dennis so let me rerun it real quick and you can see it says hello dennis here and by the way you can also go to your designer and you can see how your application will look like here but as there is really not much happening in our application it just says hello android so this is the default preview that we get through this function right here which is using the preview annotation so this is our starting point and you're going to learn a lot more about what's up in this android manifest along the way you're going to learn how to use themes and how to create your own composables to change the user interface to your liking so that's it for this video see you in the next one welcome back in this video i would like to talk a little more about this preview here so what you can see is that if we go to our designer it says hello android and that is 
still the case, even though here we said hello Dennis or hello name, as we had in our fun greeting here. But this has the annotation of add preview and the add composable annotation. So if we want to see the changes in our designer, we also need to make the changes for our preview option down here. So instead of saying greeting Android, we could say welcome to tutorials.eu. And you can see that now the change is being made directly inside of my preview screen. So that's something you have to consider when you now run the application. It will, however, still say hello, Dennis. So there we are. It still says hello, Dennis. So that's what you can basically do with your preview annotation here. Okay, so the main point here was really to see that there is a difference between the preview to the actual project that we have. So I want to show you something else. And that is that this text here is in fact a composable because I just said that, right? But we didn't check it. So how can we check whether this text is a composable? Well, you can hold the control key and click on text. And then you will see that this is a function called text, which has this add composable annotation assigned to it, which means that it is a composable function. So now you also see that there are a bunch of different properties that can be changed for this text. And we have changed the text property of this text composable. So here you see we created a text object, you could say, because even though this is not a class, it's a function, but it's pretty much like an object. And we set its property of text to hello name. And this name is just this variable here, as we saw. So now let's go ahead and create our own composable. Okay, so let's use the add composable keyword and then create a function. And I'm going to call this my app. Okay, so this will just be a very simple composable that will itself use a composable inside of it, which will be text. So now we can define properties and you see there is one that is required. So otherwise this text composable function will throw an error. So it's not happy with not having a parameter. So all of the other settings that you have here are not necessary. You don't have to define them, but the text needs to be defined. Okay, so let's define the text property to have the value of welcome to this video, for example. And then in the default preview, instead of using this dog profile page theme and stuff, let's get rid of this and use my app instead, like so. So now we're using our composable that we created inside of our default preview and can run this. So now we need to refresh this. It will quickly render it again and you can see it says welcome to this video. Now as a little challenge, I would recommend that you play around with this a little bit. So go over to your text and see what could be interesting things that you can define. So the color, for example, is unspecified. The font size is unspecified. So let's change the font size real quick. Therefore, I'm going to add a comma. I can add it at the end here. And now access font. You can see there are different options here. I'm going to set the font size to, let's say, 30 dot. SP. Therefore, I need to import SP. So hover over SP and either click on import here or Alt Shift Enter. This will add this import here at the top, which is the Compose UI unit SP. SP stands for scalable pixel. So it makes sure that the text is going to look similar on different device sizes. Okay, so if we now rerun it, we will see that the text should be bigger because I think by default, yeah, you see the text is now bigger because by default it had a lower number. So it was a smaller value and it's not the defined. So here font size unspecified. There are no details here. It doesn't say how large the default value is unfortunately, but it's going to be smaller than 30, probably something around 20 or 22 is the default font size. So now you could go ahead and change a bunch more settings here, the font family, the font style and so forth. But for now, what was important to display in this video is how to change the preview and how to 
work with composables and and the text composable. Welcome back. In the next couple of videos, we are going to build this a little profile page that you can see here. So we called it simple dog profile application and that's exactly what it should be about creating simple dog profiles as you see here. So while this might seem simple what we have here, there is a lot going on and you are going to learn a lot about pre-built composable UI elements. This will expose you to some basic composables as well as attributes. So let's go back to our project and create a new file. So inside of your doc profile page, go ahead and create a new Kotlin class file and select file here. And I'm going to call this one profile page. Make sure to use file and not class because I don't want to use a class here. This should be really a simple file. So let's go ahead and create our first composable function in here using the composable keyword composable like so. Therefore, you see, we need to import Android X compose runtime composable and we haven't done that manually or I, I haven't, this has been done for me by the IDE Android Studio. So I'm going to call this one profile page. Okay, so this will contain my entire profile page, so to speak. And now what I want to have is a column. Therefore, I can just go ahead and use the column in here. This is another composable. So let's import it. And you can jump into it and you can see it has this add composable annotation. So a column needs to be defined. So you can see here, I couldn't use the brackets, I would have had to enter some details. And you can jump in here and see we would have had to add the modifier vertical arrangement and so forth. But what we're going to do instead is we're going to use the curly brackets. This will give us the column scope. And this column composable is used for vertical placing of other UI elements. So putting them together. It is one of the layout composables that allows you to place items within it. So let's add an image inside this column. Okay, so now I would like to add an image to all my project. And therefore I can go over to the resource manager, click on this plus and import drawables. And then I just need to go over to the folder where I have my drawable. And I'm just going to enter the path here and select the Husky. So there is my image. I'm going to click next and import this image. So now it will be available in my drawables. Okay, now that I have the image ready, Let's go ahead and actually use it in my column. So inside of my profile page, therefore we can use the image composable. So the image needs a couple of parameters. We need to import image as well. And here we're going to use the compose UI graphics here. And it's this one, this compose foundation image. We need to define the painter and I'm going to define the painter resource which has the ID of r.drawable.husky. Okay, so this was the name of the file in my resource manager. You see, it has this name husky and it's inside of my resources. So you can go over to your project and then go to resources. This is the R, this greater R dot folder called drawable. And there is this husky JPEG that was added. Okay, so that's how you can find the path here. And now that we have the painter, I'm going to define the content description as well. So content description will be Husky, like so. And you see now my image is happy. I don't get the error anymore. And I'm pretty much content with what I have. So the image composable is used for displaying pictures and it accepts two compulsory parameters, painter and content description. So painter requires the painter resource, which can just be a drawable with the ID as we've seen. And then we need to enter the content description, which accepts a string or null. Okay, so we wouldn't have to enter something specifically, we could have passed null as well. To preview the elements we just added, we need a preview function. So let's add one below our profile page function. So here, can you recall how the preview function would look like? 
Well, we can just learn from our main activity. So we needed this preview annotation and the composable annotation. So let's go over here and let's add this preview annotation as well as the add composable and then create a function called profile page preview like so. And now let's just call our profile page function, which is this one that we've just created. Now in the designer or in the split view, we need to build and refresh. And this will then allow us to see our Husky inside of our designer here. And there we are, we have our little Husky. So now let's add two text elements underneath this image. Because we use this column, it can contain multiple different items in it. So let's go ahead and just add a text composable with a text property of Siberian Husky. All right, let me add the text here, which is our compose one. So again, the compose material text here. And now let's add another text. This one will have the text of Germany. Okay, so let's say it sits in Germany, this little Husky. Okay, let's refresh this page and we should see the image and underneath we should then see our text. So you can see here, Siberian Husky, Germany. Now, unfortunately, the background is gray. So how can we change that? Well, actually, we just need to add this show background true. So you see the background is white. We can get that by adding this to our preview annotation as well. So now you can see well, once it is added that the background is white now. Okay, so now let's go over to our main activity and get rid of this entire stuff that we had. So the greeting, the my app, and instead of calling greeting here, let's call our profile page that we just created. And let's run our application to see if it's going to display accordingly onto our emulator. So now we should see our Husky. You see the text as well here, Siberian Husky from Germany. Okay, so you see it's not perfect yet. The image really just doesn't use the entire available space and so forth. So there are a bunch of things that we can still improve, but that's something that we are going to see in the next video. So we're going to decorate the screen. Welcome back. In the last video, we ended up with this result that we have right here. And as you might recall, this is what we want to get. So we need to change the size of the image. We want to get this circle around it. And then you can also see that here at the bottom, we have a couple of different details that we want to display as well. So let's implement all of that. And first of all, we're going to look at modifiers because I want to modify this image here. All right, let's go over to our project. And therefore, if we look at our image, and that is the profile page KT file, if you recall, and here we had this image, which is this composable that we're using. So we are setting the painter property, we are setting, setting the content description, but then there is also something called modifier. Okay, so let's add the modifier in here, modifier, and it's like this modifier. And we need to use the modifier class here. And there are a couple of settings that we can set or a bunch of functions that we can use. For example, we can set the size and you can see we can either set the size with density pixels, the width and height with density pixels and so forth. So there are different options. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set this to have a size of 100 dp. Therefore, I need to import the DP as well as modifier namespaces. And I'm going to use the compose UI option here. And then let's import size as well. Okay, now you can see we have foundation layout size, we have the UI modifier as well as unit DP added to our namespaces up there. So now this modifier can have multiple settings. So I have set the size, I can now also clip it at the same time. So I can clip the shape. Now I need to pass in a shape. So let's import clip here. And then there is this shape called circle 
shape. So this one right here, which is also inside of Android X Compose Foundation shape. Okay, so now the image will get a circle shape, will have a size of 100 density pixels. And I would like to also add a little red circle around it, as you can see here. So we have this little red circle around the Husky. Before we do that, let's quickly look at what we get at this point, because the image should already be changed quite significantly here. You can see that the image is now circled, so to speak, right? Now we need to still make a couple of changes. So first of all, I'm going to add a border here. Okay, so this is the red border that I want to have. And it's going to have a width of two density pixels. And therefore we need to import border once again, and then use 2.dp to get the two density pixels. And then I think it makes sense to put this in the second line. So it's a little more readable. So we have the width, then we're going to set the color and I want the color to be red. So we can just use color dot and then the different colors are available or made available to us. And I'm just going to use red here. And finally, I'm going to set the shape to be a circle shape. So this should be using a circle shape as well. So the border itself should also be a circle shape. So here we just clipped it. So we cut it, so to speak. And here we are adding the border with a particular shape. So if we rerun this, we will see that now our Husky has a red circle around it. So this image, even though it's quite small. So you could, of course, if you wanted to change that to 200 dB to make this image a little bigger there. So now this image is almost taking the desired shape, but there is still one more fix as the left and right parts of the images, if you look at it, are not fitted in. So they're not fitted in properly. And to change that, we need to add a content scale property to the image. Okay. So there is this additional property. You see, we had the painter we had the content description, the modifier, but then there is another one and the one, and let me put that correctly in here, like so. Actually, we can put the comma directly after the last statement. And now we can add the content scale property. Okay, I'm going to set that to content scale dot crop. You see, there is this UI layout content scale from UI compose. So again, another compose item, this one here. Okay, now we should crop it per properly. So the image will now be cropped in. You see now we see our beautiful little Husky with the red circle around him. So I would like to align this image as well, because currently it's aligned towards the top left corner, but I would like to align it towards the center. And in order to do that, I can align the entire column, because if you recall, this is inside of a column. So this entire thing, our entire code here is inside of the column. But how do I now go ahead and add properties to the column? Because there are no brackets around the column. Well, the curly ones, but not the circle ones. So we can change that by adding circle brackets here and it will still work the same. So now we can just go ahead and add the properties that we want to change for our column. And the one that I want to change is going to be the horizontal alignment. So I'm going to set the alignment to be centered horizontally. So that's going to be one of the settings that I'm going to use, but then I'm going to set another one for my column. And that will be that the modifier will make sure that we are filling the maximum size, which means we're going to take the space that is available for us and not just as it's currently. So fill max size. And here, this will now fill the entire available size for the screen. So basically it's going to say, okay, for this dog, take the entire width that you have available and then center the dog in the middle or put the dog into the center. Okay. So we are talking about columns here, right? So a column, well, we have one column so far and we're going to see how we can later on use rows as well. But currently we have one column where items are put on top of each other. So now if you run this again, we should see that the dog is now centered. So we achieved this by 
aligning it towards the center and making sure that we are taking the entire width available. Okay, so I just talked about rows and columns, right? Because this is inside of column, but now let's look at rows specifically. So we can go ahead and put multiple columns into a row. And this will make sense specifically if we want to achieve this behavior here. So you see, we have column one, column two, and column three. So we have three columns here, whereas this is in row one. So this 150 is in row one and followers is in row two. And this year as well, row one is 100 and following is in row two. So if we want to achieve that, we need to use rows with columns. So let's put it underneath our image because it's still inside of that one column. So we just have one column, the entire width of the screen, so to speak. And now we can create a row in it. So there is this row composable, we need to import that as well. It's this row here. And now we can go ahead and add columns in there once again. And these columns, they will align towards the center as well. So I'm going to use the same setting that I had here with horizontal alignment, like so. Okay, so let me copy it from here, copy, paste in there. Okay, so now this column will be aligned towards the center. And in there, I would like to have a text property, which has the value for the text of 150, for example. And you see, if you look at it, the font here is bold. So the font weight is bold. This is thick here. And this one is not bold. So followers is not bold, but the 150 is bold. So how can we make it bold? Well, we looked at properties before, right? So there's this font weight property, and we can just go ahead and use font weight dot bold for this. Okay, so now this will make the text bold. And now we will have another text in here, and this will be our followers. So we're just gonna say followers like so in here. And now I'm not very happy with the positioning of this one, so this should be better. And now what we want to have is multiple columns inside of this row. And now if we check this out, we need to run, so we need to rebuild. Unfortunately, we cannot just apply the changes with a hot restart. And we'll see this is what we get. So 150 followers, then Siberian Husky, Germany. And I think actually this row should be underneath the text. So let's see. Yes. So let's just drag this row from here underneath the two texts that we had. That will do the trick basically. That's pretty cool. So let's rerun this. And there we see Siberian Husky, Germany and 150 followers. So this is the second row that we created. So far, this doesn't really make sense unless we have multiple columns, obviously. So let's go ahead and create multiple columns. Therefore, I'm just going to copy and paste this here and we'll make a couple of changes to it. So this one was 100, for example, and it was following, not followers. And this one was posts. Okay, so how many posts does our doggo have? Yes, 30. So let's rerun this. Well, you see, we get the error here. So if you get this error, this probably has to do with you not rerunning it properly, but doing the hot refresh. And you see there we have our followers, following and posts. But they are pretty close together, very narrow. So if you want to have a little bit of a distance, what you would do is you would say that this row where they are in should take the entire available space. So let's do that. Let's add a property to our row here where we can say that it should take the entire available width. So it should be aligned where the arrangement is spaced evenly. So they are apart from each other evenly. Therefore, we can use the horizontal arrangement. So horizontal, and actually it's not very happy with my row here. Let me put it like this horizontal arrangement where the arrangement is spaced evenly. So you can try the different settings and see how it will affect your application. And then I'm going to add a modifier here. So modifier, which will make sure that I'm filling the maximum width. So the entire available width and here not maximum size, but width. Okay, so the row shouldn't take the entire space towards the bottom as well, but only towards the right and left hand side. Okay, 
So that's why we use width and not size. So let's rerun this and see how this is gonna pan out. And you see now they are evenly distanced to each other. So now if you want to have a little bit of a distance towards the top here as well, you can add a little bit of padding. So you can just do that with your modifier property. So you see we are changing the modifier and you can just add settings by using the dot here. So dots and then for example, adding padding of let's say 16 density pixels, which is a default padding setting that you would use in an Android application. So let's rerun this and see, there we are. We have a little bit of distance and this looks a lot more evenly spent and it's a good start. Now seeing how our code is here, we are basically copy and pasting code all the time, right? So we have this column, then we have two texts in there, the same story here, the same story here. So we are copy and pasting code. If you are copy and pasting code, then you maybe should consider putting it into a separate function. So let's go ahead and do just that. So therefore I'm going to create this function called profile stats because we just have this fun profile stats that will hold the st statistics or the values of our items. So you see what is important. Okay, so what could we extract from each of those columns? Well, what we just need to modify is basically those two texts. So the amount of followers or following or posts, so it's a count, a value, a number, so to speak, and then the actual title of the text. Okay, so let's just extract exactly that. So here I'm going to get the count, which is of type string, and then I'm going to get the title, which is also going to be of type string. So how can we now position it in there? Actually, we can just copy or cut this column out there and then replace the settings. So here, this will obviously be the count and this will be the title. So everything else can stay the same. Now we do have a little problem. You see, we get an error here. Do you recall why this could be? Well, it's because we don't have this add composable annotation. So let's add the annotation and this will fix the problem. So now we can use the profile stats in here multiple times. So let's just call this method three times, once with the count and followers. And this is obviously going to be a string as well as this one here as well. Then once again with, and I think it was 150, right? Then once again with the 100 and following and make this a string. And then finally we had the posts, I think it was 30. So count of 30 and the title was posts. All right, and then we can get rid of those columns. And now we just made our code a little cleaner because we extracted all of these composables or just this column, including the two text composables into a method or a function that we can now reuse. So let's rerun this real quick to see if our application still works and you see it still works flawlessly. Okay, so now if we look at this UI, you see only the two buttons are still missing. And that is something that we're going to implement in the next video because I think otherwise this video would be too long. So see you there. Quick pause. In this video, you're learning something about app development. And if you want to learn more about Android Jetpack Compose specifically, then you should definitely check out my Android Jetpack Compose masterclass in which you are learning the fundamentals of Jetpack Compose, but then also go into more advanced topics by building multiple applications. For example, we're going to build an entire news application from scratch, which contains loading data from an API using retrofit, then using coroutines and the MVVM architecture in order to make it a really clean application and a lot more. So it's a 16 hour long course where you get the code, exercises, quizzes, and obviously also the Q&A support. So whenever you have questions, you can ask them and we're going to help you out. So get the course down in the description. You get a huge discount over 80% and I hope to see you in that course. So now let's get back to the video. Welcome back. In this video, I would like to add those two buttons here at the bottom. So the follow user button as well as the direct message button. And they're not going to do anything as of now, but I want to have them inside of my application.
So where would they be positioned? Well, I would say underneath this row here, where you see we have the profile stats. So what do we need? Actually, just another row. Okay, so we need another row, but this time with two buttons. So let's add it to our application. Therefore, we um, actually can copy from this row. So let's copy all of this stuff here because I want to have the same settings. I want to make sure that I have a little bit of distance towards the top and at the other sides. I want the buttons to be spaced evenly. So I can just go ahead and copy the settings from this row here. But now inside of the curly brackets, I can go ahead and add the buttons that I want to have in there. So let's go ahead and just add a button. And you see, this is the default settings that I get here a button which is a composed material. So let's just add this button. So you see here we have this on click which is automatically created for us and with curly brackets. So we could add whatever we wanted in here that should then be executed once we click on the button. And currently we're not going to do anything but you see there is a to do here which lets us know hey there is still something to implement. But now I want to define the button or modify the button. So how do I modify the text of a button or add a text to a button? Well, that's a cool thing in Compose. You can just go ahead and use the text composable once again. So what should be the text for it? This one will be follow user. And in this case, follow dog. <laughs> and then I want to have another button just next to it. And because we are inside of a row here, they will be next to each other. They will be arranged evenly spaced. So what should be the text of the second button? That one should say something like direct message. Okay, so let's rerun our application and see how this is gonna pan out. And we see our follow user button here as well as the direct message button. And they also have this behavior of when we click on them that they create this little effect here. Okay, and that's already it. So that was a little introduction to how to add buttons and create another row where the buttons are next to each other and you see they're spaced evenly as we wanted them to be. So we have a similar situation like we wanted to have in here. But now you see that at the current state, our Husky is all the way at the top. So we still need to make a couple of changes. So we're going to look at cards and vertical scrolls in composables. So see you in the next video. Welcome back. In this video, we are going to look at how to make this entire thing, the content, be inside of a card. So if you look at this, you can see that there is a little bit of an elevation here with a shadow. So this is called a card. So all of the other content is inside of this card. So let's go ahead and add that to our project. And therefore, we need to understand where all of our content is. And it's inside of this profile page. So basically, what we want to do is we want to put everything that is inside of this column into the card. So let's go ahead and cut it out and create this card and then put it into the card. So I just pasted it back in there. And now everything is inside of my card. Now I can style the card. So I can add a couple of properties to it. For example, the elevation. I already talked about it being this little shadow creating effect, so to speak. Okay, so it's elevated above whatever is underneath it. And here I'm just going to use six density pixels that should be a fine enough value. And then I'm going to set the modifier property with a couple of settings. So first of all, I want to fill the max size and then I want to make sure that the padding is good. So here padding should be, let's say towards the top, I want to have 100 density pixels, then towards the bottom, also 100 density pixels. And towards the left and right, I would like to have 16 dp. So start and end. So start is a left and right is end. Okay, so now I will have a padding towards the top, the bottom, the left and the right. So right and left. So let's rerun this and see if our application still works. And we can see now we have this little card that I was talking about. But our content isn't positioned very nicely as of now. So we need to make a couple of changes. But before that, I would like to make sure that it's rounded, even though 
you see it is rounded by default, but if you were to make the shape rounded yourself and you wanted to define the border manually, you would go ahead and you would use the border method here where you can use different overloads. You see here the border stroke overload with the shape or the one with the brush and shape or the one with the width and color and shape. So I'm going to use this one where I need to define the width in density pixels. So I'm gonna say I want to have a border of two density pixels and then I want to have a color. And here you could go ahead and use any color you want. So let's make it very obvious and use a black color for the border. And then let's use the shape of rounded corner shape where you then need to define what the size should be. And I'm going to use 30% for the corner to be rounded. So let's check this out. Let's rerun this. And we see this is what we get. So we get this rounded corner shape with 30% and then this black border as well. So this is this black here. You can of course use white here as well. And let me do that real quick. We see that now we don't see it, but it's going to be inside of it. So that's the invisible border that we're going to use for now. And now if we test our application and we turn the emulator around, even though in my case, the actual emulator is not turning, but you see that the application itself and the Android OS turned, you can see that now suddenly all of the content that this is disappearing. So we can only see the image. We don't see much of the rest of the content. So that's something that I would like to fix though. And therefore I need to add something called vertical scrolling. And I'm going to add that on the column level. So I want the column to be scrollable. The card itself doesn't have to be scrollable and the entire page doesn't have to be scrollable, but the column itself, this one here, should be scrollable. Therefore we can add the modifier to it and that will be the modifier vertical state. So here modifier dot vertical, I think what you scroll it was, yeah, vertical scroll, there we are. And there are different scroll states that you can now pass. Okay, and the one that I'm going to pass is the remember scroll state. Okay, so this will make sure that it remembers the scroll state that we had and I need to add the comma here for this to still work. Now, obviously this modifier here won't work anymore because we're not filling the max size anymore. And then I would also like to add a vertical arrangement for this column. So here, vertical arrangement. And this will use the arrangement.center. So I want to center my entire content of the column. Now you could go ahead and add comments here to indicate what this entire column is going to be about. So this will be content of our card, including dog, image, followers, or description, followers, etc. Okay, so now let's run this again and see how this is going to fare for us. And we see now we can scroll inside of this little card. Unfortunately, you can see that there is always this distance, 100 density pixels, which makes sense if we rotate the phone the other way around. So let me see. There it makes sense to have this distance, but in the other view, it doesn't make sense. So here, like having this huge padding towards the top is too much. You could also fix this by making sure that the application is not going to allow to rotate. That's also fine in many cases. So sometimes you don't even want to be, well, to, to allow the user to rotate the phone or to use your application in a rotated version and so forth. So Instagram, for example, doesn't allow that either. All right, so that's it for this video. In the next one, we're going to look at constraint layouts in Jetpack Compose. Welcome back. So at this point, we have this beautiful little card with our Husky and all the items looking quite good. The problem is that what we're using here are a bunch of columns with a bunch of rows and it can become quite 
complex when it comes to more complicated and advanced user interfaces. So this is a rather simple one, but sometimes things are just more complicated. And in that case, it really makes sense to use something called a constraint layout, which is also recommended by Google as the way to build your user interfaces. So in this video, we are going to restructure this entire user interface using a constraint layout, and that can help us place composables relative to others on the screen. And it is really an alternative for our nested row and column box custom layout elements that we have used so far. So constraint layouts are really helpful when it comes to larger layouts with complicated alignments. So the steps that we need to take include creating a reference for each composable in a constraint layout. So we need to have the name, for example, for this image here, it has to have an ID, let's call it dog image, for example. Then the text could be called breed. This could, for example, be the location where the dog is or whatever, okay? So everything has to have a name and then we can find it. And then we can use those modifiers to actually constrain them to other composables or elements. So for example, we know that dog image, for example, is above the breed, okay? And then at the same time, we see that the dog is towards the top. So it's the, the most top element that we have. And then everything can be relative to each other. So this element here with the text and the followers is next to this one. So it's towards the left so towards the border of your screen and then or to the card specifically here and then to the right it has this element where it says 100 following and then to the right it has 30 posts and so forth right so we're going to set all of this up it sounds quite complicated and it really isn't too uncomplicated but <laughs> we're going to be fine so let's just have a look at this the first thing that we will need to make sure is that we do have an implementation inside of our build.gradle app file. So colon app here in the brackets is really important, otherwise this won't work. So here in the dependencies, so you can scroll all the way down, you will find dependencies down here. Here you are basically saying which kind of packages you want to be available for your project. And the ones that we have by default is here, for example, Compose UI, and you see we're using Compose UI. Then we have the material from Compose, we have the tooling preview so that we can preview our Compose layout and so forth. Okay, so now here we need to add the following line. Let me paste it in here. It's going to be this Android constraint layout, colon constraint layout minus Compose colon 1.0.0 minus RC01. This is going to be the version that I'm going to use here specifically. And this will now allow us to use constraint layouts. Therefore, we need to make sure to sync it. So click on sync now, otherwise this won't work obviously. So now once the syncing is done, we can go back to our profile page and now use constraint layouts inside of here. Okay, so let's convert this entire page. So the profile page to use instead of columns, our constraint layouts. Now, unfortunately, if I do that, then all of this other stuff will cause some errors for now, but let's have a look. So I'm going to con use constraint layout here. Okay, so this one right here, constraint layout. Now, obviously I get some errors here because we need to, as I said, define the IDs. So for example, the image needs to know what name it has and so forth. So we need to create references and let's do that for every single composable. So therefore inside of our constraint layout and as this constraint layout is not a column, but it is something different, we don't need to define properties in it. So we can get rid of that. You see now the arrows disappeared, but this by itself will not fix our issues. So we need to create a reference ID for the image composable, for example. So we can just go ahead and create a value which will be of type image and we'll define it as create refs. So we create the reference IDs here. So now we can add a reference to our image. So you see we have this modifier for our image. Okay, this modifier has the size, the clip, the border, 
And now we can add a constraint as. So here constraint as and give it a name. So I'm just going to constrain it as image. When we use constraint as, however, we also need to define how something is positioned. So for example, the image is going to be connected towards the top. Okay, so we use here top dot link to. So we're linking it to an anchor. And here we can just go to parent dot top. So we're linking it to the top of the parent. Now it is linked to basically its parent, which is the card itself where it is inside of. So this image is inside of the constraint layout, which is connected to the card, which is now going towards the top. And then we need to define that it will be at the link left side as well. So we link it towards the left side of the parent. So parent dot start. So start is left, the left side and end is the right side. So end dot link to and here parent dot end. Okay, now we need to define this modifier with those constraints for our text as well. So for the Siberian Husky, so modifier, and I'm going to use modifier, and this has to be separated by a comma. Okay, so modifier dot, and we can use the constraint as here as well. So now we need to say what the reference name for this text will be. So how are we going to call this text? And I'm going to call this text name text. And now I can connect it to my top of the bottom of the image. So what is going on here? Let's have a look at this. So what I'm saying here is the top of this name text, so the Siberian Husky, should be connected to the bottom of the image. So it should be underneath the image. And the image is this one here. So now I can go ahead and also make sure that the left is linked to the left hand side of the screen by connecting it to the parent and the right is linked to the right hand side of the screen. So parent and okay. So now for us to test this, let's comment everything else out all the way up to the bottom row. Okay, so I'm going to comment all of those parts out and I still get an error. So here, now I have a reference to my image, but I don't have a reference to my name text. So I need to add that reference here as well. So let me add the name text here as well. And I realized that this should be called create refs like so, and then the arrow will disappear as well. So now let's run this real quick to see if our UI is still going to work. At this point, we should only get the image and the text. So the name of the dog breed. So there we are. We have the image and we have the text. Okay. But now we're using the approach that Google wants us to use. Yeah. All right. So this is how we added the name text. Now, as a little challenge for you, can you add this text here? So this text, which says Germany, where the dog currently is situated or lives currently, can you make sure that this will also be on the screen, but will be underneath this text here, which says Siberian Husky. So you will need to create a modifier and you will need to change those things up just a tiny bit. Okay, so please go ahead and try this for yourself. All right, I hope you tried it. So I'm going to comment this in. So comment this, uncomment this, so to speak. <laughs> and then I will need to add the modifier in here. And you know what? I'm just going to copy this modifier here and just make sure that the name that I give this, so the ID, so to speak, for my location text will be different. So I'm just going to call this one, for example, country text. Okay, so this will be country text. Where is the dog? So obviously the country text doesn't exist. So we need to create the reference up here. So let's add the reference, the country text. Now let's make sure that it will be underneath, not the image, but underneath the name text. So here we can say that 
the top of this text here, which says Germany, which has the name of country text or the ID of country text, should be at the bottom of the name text, which means just underneath it. So let's have a look at this. Let's see how this is going to pan out. And there we are. So we have the Siberian Husky and underneath we have Germany. So how do we now add the other ones? So let's add the row, for example, here. Let's start with the first row before we add all of the other rows. Okay, so inside of this row, we have the profile stats, which are linked together, which is still okay. So we can still use composables as we have done here where we use a column and it's connected but as you see we use co a column and before that we use the column within a row within a column and that's really something you should uh, try to avoid because all of this nesting of columns and rows to at a certain point is just becoming inefficient when it comes to performance so that's why we are even bothering to set up this constraint layout Okay, so this is really something you should take into consideration. All right, so now that we have this managed, let's go ahead and add the row. So we have a modifier for the row already, so that's cool. So now we can just add our constraint as and give it the name. I'm going to call this one row stats. And then I'm going to link it. Okay, so top link to and here I can just go ahead and link it to the country text. So country text like so. And to its bottom to be more precise. So I want this row to be underneath our country text. And I want it to be called row stats. And obviously I need to add the row stats to my references that we need to create. Okay, so here at the beginning of the constraint layouts we have our image, the name text, the country text, the row stats right now. So let's check it out and see how this is going to pan out. And we see we have our row with the followers, following and posts. Okay, so that seemed to work. That's perfect. So now we have our profile stats beautifully. And you see we didn't have to add this that it's linked to the left or to the right. We just say it's underneath the existing text. And now you might think you could have gotten rid of these two LR lines here as well. But let's check it out. Let's see how this is going to work out. And you see now Germany is all the way to the left. Because we didn't say that it should be linked to the left and to the right. Because if we link it towards the left and to the right, it will be dragged towards both directions, which will end up pulling it directly into the center where we want it to be. Like we have it with the Siberian Husky. Okay, so let me get rid of those two lines and run it again. There we are. So why do we not need it for the row? Well, this row by default is going to fill the max width as we have defined it here. Okay, so we defined that it should take the entire width possible. So we don't need to define that it should be linked to the left and the right. All right, now at the, uh, underneath of it, we have our row with the buttons. Okay, so now we don't need to put an extra row for the buttons. What we can do is we can position the buttons directly. So let me get rid of all of this unnecessary code. But obviously, we need to add modifiers to our buttons. So the modifiers, where would we put them? Well, we put them at the bottom or button level at its parameters here. So we are defining that we need a modifier here. So let me put that in a second row or line modifier dot. And here, what we need to do is to use constraint s. So do we have it directly here? Well, you see, there are so many different methods, right? So let's just tap it out constraint s. There we are. So now we need to give it a name. So let's give this a name of button follow. So this will be the follow button. And obviously, once we create this ID, we need to add it up here as well. Okay, so let me put that in a second row for it to be still readable very well. And then we can go ahead and define where this button should be. And I'm going to say that it should be linked to the row stats dot bottom. And then I can also directly 
define a margin, for example. So I want to have a little bit of a distance to it. So I'm going to add a margin of 16 density pixels to it. Now at this point, it created a little bit too many brackets for me. Then I want to make sure that it is linked to the left-hand side. So link to the parents start and to the, well, the end will only work once we have the button that we want to have right next to it. So let's run this real quick just to see well, without this button here. Let me cut it out for a second. So you see, this is where the follow user will be. Let's just add this additional button, the second one, and I'm just going to copy this part here and put it in here. So this one will be the button message. So let's rename it button message. Let's make sure to add it as well here to our references. And now we can use the button message. And I want it to be also underneath the row stats. And I want it to not be at the parent start, but towards the button follow. So it, its left side should be to the right of the button follow. And this means that we need to say end. So button follows end, so its right hand side should be to the left hand side of our button message. That's what I'm defining here. And at the same time, it should be linked to the right hand side of the entire screen or to its parent to be more precise. So here I'm going to define it as the parent. So let's see how this is going to pan out. You see now the button is connected to, well, is to the right of the follow user. Now let's also make sure that there is a relationship in both directions. So I'm going to link this right hand side also to the button message, how I call it, right? So to its left side, so to its start, which means we need to use the link to method. So now the width is something that I'm going to define as well, where I'm going to say the dimension should be wrap content. So it should only be as wide, this button, as the content requires, which this wrap content does for us. So it's not going to be wider than it needs to be, basically based on the text that we have inside of it. Okay, so let's check it out. And you see now our buttons are perfectly linked to each other because we have specifically set the constraints now. But now we have one a little problem, and that is our Husky here at the top. It's directly linked to the card, so there's no more space at the top. Let's take care of that as well. Therefore, we will need to use something called a... And therefore, we will need to use something called a guideline. And guidelines are invisible lines for positioning elements to a particular point on the screen from different axes. So now we want to create a guideline from the top. Let's go ahead and assign it. Therefore, let me go up a little bit. So here, when I'm creating my reference, I'm also going to create my guideline. So guide align, as I'm going to call it, and this one will be called create guideline, or we call the method guideline from top. Okay, so here I'm creating a guideline of 0.3f. And I need to make sure that I'm not using capital L here. So the method that was predefined. So what this will do is it will create a distance of a third towards the top. So it will go down a bit. So now instead of making sure that my image is going to be here towards the top of the parent, which is cur currently the case. You see it's directly connected to the parent. I wanted to use the guideline. So here I'm not going to say dot top, but basically just to the guideline here. So link to the guideline. 
Let's rerun this and see how this is going to pan out. And you see now it created all of this distance for us. So it's at the second third, so to speak, of the screen. So that's how you can define the guideline. So let's play around with this. Let's say we set this to 0 0.1. And now you see that there is significantly less of a distance. So you could play around with this and see what fits your requirements. Okay, and that's pretty much how we can rebuild our UI that we had built before in a constraint layout, which as I said, is the best practice approach. And well, now you know. So the structure is always the same. Make sure that you create the references with the name that you then want to use in your constraint as, as a parameter. And then in curly brackets, you do the linking to either the parent and start means left, end means right, top means at the top of obviously and bottom at the bottom of whatever you are linking it to. So our image is now linked towards the guideline that we created, which just pushes it a little further down. It is linked to the left hand side and it is linked to the right hand side of its parent, which is this card. Because if we look at it, our constraint layout is inside of this card. And it's going to be a little more obvious once I connect those two like so. So now it's obvious as a constraint layout is directly inside of the card, which is inside of the profile page. Okay, so that's it for this video. In the next video, we're going to look at how we can use constraint layouts with the coupled API. So see you there. Welcome back. In this video, you are going to learn how to use the constraint layout with a decoupled API that can help us build different designs for the portrait and the landscape orientation. So we're simply going to decouple the constraints from the layout they apply to by creating different constraint sets for each orientation. So what does that even mean and why would you bother? So the thing is, we have our screen as it looks like this right now. And if we want to rotate it, or if the user wants to use it in landscape mode, we want to see something like this, where we have the image on the left hand side with the text of Siberian Husky in Germany underneath it. But then we have also the followers following and posts in a different way. Okay, so basically, this is the design that I want to have in the end. So of course, you could say there should be less of a distance here at the bottom or something like that. So that's really up to you. Or if you want to have some more space here at the bottom to then add more items later on, that's good as well. But the thing is, we don't get this behavior as of now, we have to define this specifically, we need to specifically define where every single item needs to be for the portrait mode, which we have defined in the last video, as well as for the landscape mode, which we're going to do in this video. But therefore, we will need to make a big change to our application to our code base. So let's go ahead and change our code up quite a bit here. Therefore, what we're going to start with is going to be something called a constraint set. Okay, so I'm going to create this private function called portrait constraints. Okay, so here I will pass in the margin that I want to use throughout the entire method. Okay, you need, you need to import dp here for it to work. And it should return a constraint set. So this method when it's called, it will return a constraint set. So let's go ahead and return a constraint set. So constraint set this one here. So now we need to say what we want to have in this constraint set. So how do we want to constrain all of our items here? So for example, we have this constraint for our image. And I'm going to close Samsung Dex because it's going to constantly want something from me. So here we have the constraint as with the image and the top link to start link to and end link to. And this is linked to the guideline and so forth. But now let's look at how we can set this up inside of our constraint set here. Therefore, we need to have a reference to our image. So let's give it a reference by calling the create ref for method. And here we need to pass in the ID that we want to use and I'm going to give it the ID of image. So now I can create a constraint for my image. So here I pass in the image and I can define what I want to have. So let me just copy the 
constraint that I have for my image from here. Like so, copy it and paste it in here. Even though the guideline of course now does not exist, I'm just going to, well, keep it simple and say that it should be linked to the parent top. So now let's do the same thing for our next item on the list. So what would be the next item? Well, I'd say it's the name text. So let's go ahead and create a reference for the name text, like so. And now we need to add the constraint for that name text. So here, name text should have the constraint. And now let's see what constraints we have for the name text. And it was this one here. We called it name text. So here you see modifier constraint as name text. So let's just copy this part out and put it in here for the name text. And now we need to do the same thing for all of the other items as well. Even though here we're just copy and pasting because we had the constraints set up for the portrait mode. But now we want to have them for the landscape mode as well. So let's first of all finish the portrait mode and then go over to the landscape mode. So I'm just going to simplify this and set up all of the properties that we're going to need here. So all of the variables the country text, the row stats, and I'm gonna call them row stats like this, button follow, button message, and guideline. Okay, so now let's go ahead and create the constraints for them. So we have the name text. Now let's go ahead and add the country text, which will just be to the bottom of the name text. So it's top, the country text top will be linked to the bottom of the name text. So it will be underneath it. It will be towards the left of the parent or it's left will be at the left of the parent and the right will be at the right of the parent, which will drag it. So we will get it like so where the text is in the middle. So that's what we get by dragging it towards both sides. Okay, for the country text. Now let's add the row stats as well. So where we have the stats in one row as well as the button to follow. And here we have something, let me see, that we have the width as well, yeah. So basically we have the same approach, only that the margin now will be defined as the margin that we are passing to the portray constraints method. So this parameter that we have here will just be used here. All right, and now the same thing for the message button. Okay, button message will be linked to the row stats bottom it will be to the right-hand side of the button follow. So its left will be to the right of the button follow. Okay, so that's what we're saying. And its right will be to the end of the screen. So to the parent end, to the right-hand side of the screen. And we're wrapping the content for the width. So now, if we do that, we can go ahead and use this portray constraint but therefore we need to make sure that our constraint layout will be inside of something called a box with constraints. So let's create this box with constraints and now we can create the constraints in here. So constraints, which will be defined using an if statement. So if the min width will be 600 density pixels, so if the width of the screen that we have available will be 600 density pixels, then please use my portrait constraints with a margin of 16 density pixels. And then otherwise, so in the else block, set up the landscape mode. So here to do call landscape constraints. So we need to, of course, set up the landscape constraints method, which will be pretty much the same thing as our portrait constraints method, but has different values assigned to it. So different constraints. So now we just need to tell our constraint layout that it should use this constraints variable. So it should really modify its appearance based on the settings that we have defined. So here, con, and I should call this one constraints like so, then it makes sense. So now if I use these constraints, you see suddenly all of this stuff doesn't work anymore. So create refs doesn't work anymore. The image with its constraint as doesn't work anymore. So we need to get rid of this stuff altogether. So let me delete this. And the same goes for this create references and guideline because we cannot use it anymore. So let's do the same thing 
with our well for the text we don't need the modifier to define it here anymore the same goes here so let's get rid of this i think it even goes all the way up to here and the same goes for this modifier well actually only for the constraints because here we want to keep the rest as we had it and here we use the modifier only for constraints either so let's get rid of the entire modifier and same goes here even though i just realized that we will need to use the modifier to assign an id so now let's assign ids to each of those items okay so we have those ids that we have here you see create ref for id for the image for the name text for the country text the row stats and so forth right so now we need to say that for example the the image here at the top will have that particular id so let's assign this id to it therefore i'm going to add the layout id here and this one will be the image then we need to add an id to my text so Let's use the modifier dot layout ID and call this one, what do we call it? Name text, I think. Name text. And the same goes for this one here. Separate with a comma, add the modifier, and actually modifier should be the modifier, as well as modifier should be the modifier here. And this one will be the country text. So now the row needs an ID as well. So Let's add a layout ID, and I think we call it row stats. Row stats. The button here, modifier, and not this, but modifier, like so, with the modifier dot layout ID, and this one was the follow button. How do we call it? Button follow, okay. And here we need to do the same thing with button and what was it message so now obviously all of our constraint layout should be inside of this box with constraints so let's make sure that we add the closing bracket in here and now our constraint layout will use the box with constraints and after having done that, just for testing purposes, let's add this portrait constraints in here as well. Because otherwise, this constraints would be empty and you cannot pass in an empty constraints setting for the constraint layout. So we're just saying, okay, constraint layout, please use the following settings, the constraints set that we have created for you. Okay, so you can see constraints is of type constraint set, which is exactly what the constraints will return or will be of type because the portrait constraints method is returning a constraint set. So we have set up all of this set items and now we can use it for our application. So now currently, because we don't have the other constraint set, which would be the landscape constraint set, this will not do anything for us. So this will basically be the same thing as we had it before, where the application is going to look the same no matter in which way we are using it or in which format we're using it. So let me open up DEX again to display this. Okay, so there we are. So we don't have this distance to the top. We are going to fix that later, but you see, that this is currently what we're getting. So it's not exactly the design that I showed you earlier. It's still fine, it should be okay, but it's not really the design that I want to have. So I would like to design it in a way where these parts here, so the followers following and posts will be to the right hand side of the Siberian Husky. So let's set this up now. Therefore, we will need to create an extra method which will be similar to this portrait constraints. So let's go ahead and set it up, private, fun, and this one will be landscape constraints, which will use a margin of density pixels and it will return a constraint set. So now let's return the constraint set once again, constraint set. 
like so. And now we need to say how this constraint set should look like. Therefore, we will need to have the references to all of the items as well. So let's get those references in there. And now we can start defining how the constraint should look like. So let's start with the constraint for our image. Okay, so the image, how do we want the image to be positioned? So I want to link it to the parent top. And then I want to have a little bit of a margin as well. So I'm going to set the margin to be the margin. And the start of it should be linked to the parent dot start with the margin being the margin that we defined up here. Okay, so this margin, this is what this margin here is. Okay, so this is just the image for now. We don't have any constraints for all of the other items. So so let's look at, at how this is going to do, do on our device. So we turn it around and well, it's not using this constraint set yet. So let's set this up real quick. And where would that be? I hope you can figure it out. It's this part here. So let's use the landscape constraints again with a margin of 16 density pixels. So now we're going to use this other constraint. So this other setup that we have started, but they haven't finished yet. And for now we only have defined where the image should be positioned. So let's turn around our device and you can see the image is positioned here and everything else is just crammed towards the top left side because it doesn't know where it has to be. It doesn't have any constraints, which is why we get this weird look in our application. So we can't even see the name of the dog as well as the other buttons and so forth because they are all on top of each other, all towards the left. So let's fix that. Therefore, let's go ahead and design how our landscape constraint should be looking. So I'm going to add the constraint to the name text and I'm gonna paste them in here and talk through what's up. So the name text should be to the image says start. So to the left hand side of the image and it should be underneath. So it's top, the name text top should be underneath the image. So what I want with this is it should be at the left underneath of the image. You will see how this is gonna look like. Now let's do the same thing with the country text. Okay, so the country text, however, should be underneath our name text. So it's top, so it's country text top should be at the bottom of the name text. It should be to the left of the name text and to the right of the name text. So this is a little confusing, you might say, but what this will do is it will just position it exactly underneath in a centered manner. Okay, so this is what these two constraints will do for us. So let's rerun this and see how this is actually going to do. So let's turn it around and you see that we have the Siberian Husky and Germany underneath our image. So that seems to work. Now let's add the other constraints. Let's add the row constraint. And I want the row to be linked to the image, to the top of the image, but also to the right of the image. So the image's end, which is the image's right side, should be the start of the left-hand side of our row stats. And our row stats, you might recall, is this entire row thingy that we set up here. So the profile stats, which are inside of this row, which has three profile stats with the followers, the following and posts. Okay, so now I want also to link the end to the parent's end. So I want to say, go all the way to the end of the right-hand side of the parent. Okay, so its right should be on the right of the screen. So let's run this again and turn it around. And we see now the posts seem to work fine. So now we need to take care of the two buttons, right? So let's go ahead and add those constraints as well. And the button follow should be, so it's top, so it's top corner or top edge should be linked to the bottom of the row stats. So it should be underneath the row stats with a little bit of margin. And its left hand side should be to the left hand side of the row stats. And its right hand side should be at the left hand side of the bottom message. So we don't have the button message yet. Let's set that up as well. And its bottom should be linked to the country text's bottom. So this country text's bottom. 
So what, what, what it will do is it will make sure that the button doesn't overlap. Okay, now the button uh, follow will only make sense if we also have the button message because they are both important here. So let's look at the button message. Its top should be also to the bottom of the row stats as we had with our button follow. Then its start should be linked to the button follow. So to the end of the button follow. So it should be to the right of the button follow. And its end should be linked to the parent end. And then finally, the bottom of the button should be linked to the country text bottom as well. So let's rerun this and see this in action. So let's turn it around and we see that we get our little husky, we have our followers, and then we have the follow user as well as direct message positioned in the format that I wanted it to be. Okay, so now you could of course play around with the values here for your constraints for your landscape constraints setup. So now you know how you can make sure to have different layouts or how to define those different layouts inside of your Jetpack Compose application. So basically what you need to do is you need to set up the constraint sets. You could have also done it, of course, directly here, but I recommend to create extra methods decoupling it. And then we have the box with constraints in which we can then use our constraint layout with the constraints that we had set up. Okay, and this is because the min width of 600 is not given for our application if we turn it and then it goes into the landscape constraint mode. And I know constraints are really a pain in the butt, at least that's my opinion. I'm not a big fan of it. I would have preferred to use the column stuff, but it's just not as performant, which is why we just have to get used to it and use it. And once you get the hang of it, you are going to have no problems at all with it. And one thing that I didn't mention that you of course also always need to set up are going to be the layout IDs. So you need to set up those IDs to be exactly the same as we have set them up here. So now of course you could say use the guideline here for the uh, top link to for the image if you want to use it in the constraint mode. Okay, so 0 0.3 or maybe 0 0.1 and this should look a little better, I guess. So let's run it and you see now we have this distance towards the top. 0 0.3 will give us significantly more distance towards the top like so and it will center our doggy. All right, so that's it for this video. See you in the next one. There are some Kotlin concepts and styles used in Compose that we need to talk about. Some we already discussed in the previous Kotlin lectures, but need to go over them again and others you might be hearing for the first time. Because Jetpack Compose is built around Kotlin specific styles we need to get familiar with so that we can easily understand the APIs Compose has available for us. So default arguments are initial values given to a method parameters at the point of creation. So for example, the button composable is created with several parameters for which most of them have initial values or default arguments, making it possible to call a button composable without needing to provide values for all of them. So let's look at the use of button elements. So the button composable requires on click and content arguments. When we look back in the previous slide, we see that both declarations had no assignment symbol. That is this equal sign, making it necessary to provide them when the method is called and others are optional depending on the requirements you have for the composable. So you see here, there are many that have an equal sign, which means they have something defined to them by default. All right, another concept is higher order functions, which are functions that accept order functions as an argument and Compose uses them a lot. Let's look at this example. With the code block, we can directly add the function body with what should happen when the button is clicked and that is using a function as an argument, which is possible with the help of Lambda. So we can also decide to create a normal function and then call it within the block itself. 
So we have used trailing lambdas already in previous lectures. They are a special syntax for calling higher order functions whose parameter is a lambda outside of parentheses. So the row element requires a content parameter, which is a lambda. So this code works, but can look better when placed outside of the parentheses. This is an example of a trailing lambda, which is outside the row parentheses, and therefore the parentheses is removed. This way it looks more concise and less cumbersome. So let's compare that, you see, like this. So we didn't need to define the content in the brackets and so forth. So next are delegated properties. These are variables declared with the by keyword and are usually associated with a state. For example, the name state is declared using the remember keyword and then it's used within the text field to track the value directly when it changes. We will see more of this in coming lectures. And then destructing data classes. So destructing simply means creating multiple variables at once. An example is when creating reference ID in constraint layout as we have used before. With create refs, we can create different IDs at a go and use them as required. So we don't need to set them up all one by one. A very important additional aspect of what we need to look at are coroutines, which offer asynchronous programming support and can suspend execution without blocking the main thread. And Jetpack Compose is a reactive UI framework and changes its state as the user interacts with it. These states can require heavy processing and need to be performed without blocking the UI thread. Compose makes this easier by embracing coroutine at API level rather than using callbacks. So let's look at an example here. A snack bar function is a coroutine function and we can easily call the remember coroutine scope and then launch a block for show snack bar. So showing the snack bar. We're going to learn more about all of the idiomatic Kotlin codes in the coming lectures. All right, so this was a little overview slash introduction to newer topics just to give you a first look at them. We are going to work with those in more depth, obviously. So see you in the next couple of videos. Quick pause. In this video, you're learning something about app development. And if you want to learn more about Android Jetpack Compose specifically, then you should definitely check out my Android Jetpack Compose masterclass, in which you are learning the fundamentals of Jetpack Compose, but then also go into more advanced topics by building multiple applications. For example, we're going to build an entire news application from scratch, which contains loading data from an API using retrofit, then using coroutines and the MVVM architecture in order to make it a really clean application and a lot more. So it's a 16 hour long course where you get the code, exercises, quizzes, and obviously also the Q&A support. So whenever you have questions, you can ask them and we're going to help you out. So get the course down in the description. You get a huge discount over 80% and I hope to see you in that course. So now let's get back to the video. Welcome back. In this video, I would like to teach you the concepts of state and recomposition. So we're going to use something called a text field, which allows us to enter user input. And it is stateless and only displays whatever you tell it to display. To make it stateful, we need to make it own a piece of state that it can change over time. So let's look at this in an example, because all of these keywords, they don't make sense without the proper example. So here, what I have is a new Compose application the Jetpack Compose one, you can see that here by having UI theme directly here and also it's a component activity, okay? So now inside of the greet method, I'm not having a text, but what I'm going to use instead is going to be a column. Therefore, let's go ahead and add column here and the parentheses will be empty. I'm not going to add anything for now, but I will change that later. And then I'm going to use a text field and this text field needs a value and it needs to have code that should be executed on every single time that the value has changed. So when we're entering something, this method here will be called, even though it's not a method, but this lambda here will be called. So now 
what we can do is we can also add a little button here. I'm going to add an on click to it, which will be empty. So nothing will happen. And then I'm going to add an content for it as well, which will just be a text that will say display. Okay, nothing too fancy, really just a small text here. So if we run this, we will see that it's not going to look great, but yeah, that's what we're getting. So this is the text field, so the text input field, and this is the display button. So let's center them. Therefore, we can change the column properties here. And in particular, I'm going to use the horizontal alignment one. So here, horizontal alignment, which will be using the alignment center horizontally setting. And by the way, if you were wondering or get any problems with the button, make sure you, that you have my imports because otherwise you might get into the trouble using the wrong imports and then the button doesn't work as intended and then everything is confusing. So if we rebuild, we discover that our application, so even if we rebuild this now with our horizontal alignment, you can see it is horizontally aligned, but it doesn't look great. So if we rebuild, we discover that it still remains the same and this is because the composable does not really understand how to change to the alignment with no size given to it. So let's give it a fill max width using the modifier. So for the column itself, we're going to add the modifier here, modifier dot modifier or equals modifier dot. And here I'm going to use fill max width. So it should take the entire width available. Now, if we run it again, it will at least be in the center like so. But now if we want to center it in the center of our screen and not just on the horizontal level, we need to add the vertical arrangement as well. So vertical arrangement will be arrangement center, which is this option right here. And centering it is not enough. We also need to make sure that we fill the max height as well. So now you could have used fill max size. It would have done the same trick, but you can see that you can combine them. So max width as well as max height in one line. So now we have it in the center and we can get started with it. And in order to prove that fill max size works as well, let's just test it. And we can see it works flawlessly as well. That's because the column is taking the entire available width and height, and then arranges our item centered on a vertical level, as well as aligns it centered horizontally. We can also make the UI a little better by adding a space in between the elements. This can be done using a spacer. Spacer is also a composable. So let's go ahead and just add a little text here, which will say something like, hello, then we have the text field and maybe we want to have a little space in between by using the spacer. We can achieve that where we just say how much distance we want to have. So modifier dot height, and then we can just say, for example, 20 density pixels is the distance that I would like to have. And therefore we need to import density pixel. All right. So hover over it, import it, and then we should be good. So now let's use this spacer as well after the text field. So it's going to add the spacer between the text field and the button. So let's run it again real quick. So you can see this has nothing to do with state, but I just wanted to make sure that we have a little application running that doesn't look too awful or <laughs> it still looks awful, but it's not too bad. So now let's actually get to the state part where we're going to talk about the remember keyword and the mutable state. So let's get into state and recomposition. First, let's try to get the value to display on the text element as it changes on the text field. Within the greeting block, we create a remember variable of type mutable of string. So let's do exactly that. So here in the greeting method, we have all of the column stuff and so forth. But first I create this name state by remember. So we're using the by keyword and then the member berries. So here, remember and import remember as well. So alt enter, and then we need to create the mutable state of, 
and in this case it will be an empty string so let me import mutable state off here as well and to use remember as a delegate we have to manually add these imports so in case this doesn't work properly runtime remember doesn't seem to be in here let me make sure that I have it so runtime dot get value and then runtime dot set value okay and now you see the arrows disappeared so now we're using remember as a delegate so within the text field we can now pass the name state to value and then assign the string from on value change to it. So what does that mean? Well, here in text field, you see we have this value and I'm going to assign a state to it. So this will be a string, but at the same time, we're going to manage it as a state. And then on value changed, I want to make sure that the name state will be overwritten with it. And what is it? It's this it here. It which we get from this lambda here. So on value change, we get the value that is currently inside of the text field as this it variable, which we then can assign to our name state, which is the string that we have set up here, which is using the remembered keyword and has the mutable state of method. And then I would like to use this name state inside of this text hello. So instead of saying hello, I want to say hello name state. So whatever the current name state is, it should be overwritten there. So let's run this real quick and see what's going to happen there. So let me enter something and you see hello Dennis is displayed. So the display button doesn't do anything, but whatever we do here, you see it's directly reflected inside of our text up there. Even though the text field itself is stateless, but we assigned a state here, assigned the value name state to it. So now what if we only want to um, display the changes in our string there or in our text here, once we clicked on the button. So first we need to declare a variable of type string just below the remember type. So here, so here var name is going to be an empty string for now and once we click on the button we are going to say that the name should be whatever the name state currently holds and then we just need to replace the name state here with the name so basically we're saying the name state should be constantly updated right it always knows what the current state of that text field is but only once we click on the button the name that we are displaying inside of the text itself should be whatever the name state is at that point so if we run this again and i enter dennis now and i click on display well nothing happens this is because even when name gets its value from name state it still does not change at runtime because itself so the name variable this one here has no state so the compose elements are rerun to update composition when data changes, which is known as recomposition. So when this happens, composables regain its data only from a member value. So we still need to make the name value to be a remember type with a mutable state so that the text element can receive its data when it changes. So this basically just means that we need to make sure that this name here is going to have also this by remember keyword by remember and then it is a mutable state of so here or uses this mutable state of like so so now let's run it again and test this and click on display and you see now it has changed so now dennis or whatever i'm doing entering here you see will be displayed there because now our name is remembering whatever state it has and it changes whatever is looking at it so to speak okay so this text is looking at this name property and when the name property itself is being changed then 
this text knows I need to refresh my UI, so to speak. So now, even though remember is saved in memory, it does not survive configuration changes. And if we now rotate the device, the state will be lost. And this doesn't work on my emulator here, so I will need to show it on my real device. So let me run it on my Samsung. And unfortunately, there's something wrong with my emulator. I don't know what's up. I tried many different solutions. I would probably have to use a different Android Studio version, but I want to make sure that we are using all the same Android Studio version. Okay, so there we are. Let me enter something here. Let me click display and then turn it and you see the data is lost. So we don't see the name anymore. It's just gone. And this is something we can change by using the remember savable. So var name by remember is what we used so far, but there is also by remember savable available. And there are inputs, but we're not going to require them for now. So if we rerun this now and we check it again, and not on this emulator, but on that one here, <laughs> then we will see that the state will be saved even though we are rotating the screen. So let me display this, rotate the screen, and you see Hello Dennis is still stored in here. Even though it's not stored in our other text field. So in this text field, you see name state is only remembering but name is remembering and saving. So remember savable saves the variable, even though you're changing the configuration, which means you're rotating your screen. So that's really what you need to take away from this. There is something called state. And whenever you are working with state, you need to use the remember keyword and the mutable state of variable, even though the value is going to be empty at start, we are overwriting it and our UI is updating based on changes, which is really, really cool. So this allows us not to have to manually call those updates, but they are done automatically, so to speak, when the data changes, which is really powerful. So that's it for this video. See you. Welcome back. In this video, we will talk about states and composition in Jetpack Compose. And these are very important concepts that we need to wrap our hands around because we're going to use it throughout the next applications. And it's really important. And it is something that, from my understanding, is not really used in the old school approach, but it's really used in, well, one hand in Jetpack Compose, but also in Flutter and so forth. So state in an application is any value that can change over time. In Jetpack Compose, there are APIs that make working with state easier. So let's take a look at how it works. So if you are familiar with the XML-based views, Compose works different with managing changes in value. So it has to be notified when there is a change in state, for example. So for example, when something changes, you need to say this thing changed, so please do something with it. So looking at this text field, when we start typing into it, nothing happens. And this is because it does not update itself by default when a value changes due to how composition and recomposition works in Compose. So let's understand what some key terms in the world of Compose mean. So first of all, composition. Composition is a description of the UI built by Jetpack Compose when it executes composables. Then there is recomposition, which is rerunning composables to update the composition when data changes. And then there is initial composition, which is recreation of a composition by running composables the first time. So to easy track and use a value within your composable UI, you can use the mutable state of, which is integrated with the compose runtime. It is observable, making it easier to get the changes in values. So now to make sure composables are updated when its value changes, we use the remember keyword to store the state. A value computed by remember is stored in the composition during initial composition. And the stored value is returned during recomposition. So remember can be used to store both mutable and immutable objects. There are different ways you can declare a mutable state. These declarations are equivalent and are provided as syntax sugar 
for different uses of state. You should pick the one that produces the easiest to read code in the composable you're writing. The by delegate syntax requires the following additional imports. So import Android X compose runtime get value and set value. Now to create a state that will update a composable UI when it changes, we do the following. So to make the text field show the entered values, first we declare a remember mutable state of variable and then set it to value as well as to the on value change, which updates the entered value. We can also use this value as a logic in a statement and set it to other composables like a text element. So if the value is not empty, we set it to the text composable. As we move along in the lectures, we will see more use cases of state and how they change during recomposition. But generally what you need to just understand and be fine with is that it's basically just storing a vari variable and whenever this variable changes, the UI gets updated. So that's really the idea behind it. Because if, for example, you work working in old school Android app development and, and then you created a list, for example, and then you would update the data, you would have to notify the list that the data has changed. And this is something you don't have to do if you are working with state. And if you're working with the remember keyword and this mutable state of and so forth. Okay, so this might be quite advanced at this point, but once you are using it and once you've used it a couple of times, you will understand the value of it. And well, that's just how you have to handle things in Jetpack Compose. So let's get over to where we are actually going to use this in the next couple of projects. Congratulations, you're done with this video and with the basics of Jetpack Compose. So now you know how to build a user interface using Kotlin only, so without having to touch XML at all. Well, for the colors maybe, but even that can be done with Kotlin itself. So what's left to do is to hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And also don't forget to subscribe to our Android specific channel where you will learn all of the Android app development stuff that you need to know and where I will also upload the Gmail user interface application building. So where we're going to build in two hours this beautiful Gmail user interface that there is. You are going to learn a lot more about Jetpack Compose there. So definitely subscribe to that channel. Hit even the notification bell if you don't want to miss out because this is going to be an amazing video and you're going to learn so much stuff for free. So definitely check that out. And if you don't want to wait, and if you don't want to wait because that video about uh, the Gmail thing, you will only be uploaded once this video here hits 500 likes. Definitely check out the link in the description to get the entire course. And there is a lot more than just the Gmail app and this part of the video that you have seen already. There is also the news app and a lot more about MVVM, coroutines, retrofit, all of the good stuff that you need to know in order to build real world applications using Jetpack Compose. So this is, I think, the longest outro that I've done. Thanks a lot again for watching the video and see you in the next one.